book of Isaiah. We'll begin about chapter 3. In one of my favorite annual stories to read, Charles Dickens' A Christmas Carol, Ebenezer Scrooge was denying his own eyes as he looked at the ghostly apparition of his dead partner, Jacob Marley. Jacob is described as floating there before him and trying to get through to him, and and Scrooge doesn't believe he's there. And so Marley says, why do you doubt your senses? Scrooge replies, because a little thing affects them. A slight disorder of the stomach makes them cheat. You may be an undigested bit of beef, a blot of mustard, a crumb of cheese, a fragment of an underdone potato. There's more of gravy than of grave about you. (laughs) I love the scene, and I love the irony in it. And I love the fact that Scrooge did not understand truly the serious danger that he was in. And that's kind of the point of the story. A man whose life truly is headed for the depths of hell because of his meanness and his anger and his inability to show any kind of love or compassion for people. He didn't know, and so he has sent some messengers to come and and show him the danger, bring warning. And in an interesting way, the prophets are similar. They're not ghostly apparitions, but real men Real women, flesh and blood people who have come to bring a message of warning, a grave warning. This classic story of Scrooge, it it hit me just this week that it is in reality like the people of Israel in Isaiah's day who are there face to face with a serious danger, a threat, and they didn't understand it. They, They weren't seeing it. Their comfort was in the deceit of their senses. Their security was in false belief. And they thought they were secure. And they worked on their comfort. But these things would become elusive in a very short amount of time. They were about to face a grave situation, but they considered it gravy. They have no idea what was about to come. Enter Isaiah the prophet. Isaiah comes storming on the scene and he begins to preach. But he's not preaching comfort and they don't like it. They like the prophets that preach comfort. They like the prophets who say Jerusalem will always stand. The temple will always be there. We have nothing to fear, nothing to worry about. They're good with that. But when Isaiah comes along the scene preaching destruction and captivity and threats from all around, if the people won't repent and change their ways, they don't want to hear it. In Isaiah chapter 2, and we, we did chapter 2 last week, we, we covered a specific section of it on Sunday, you recall that? Isaiah chapter 2 is the beginning of a sermon that goes all the way through chapter 5. Chapter 1 is more of an introduction, we get to chapter 2, and chapter 2 through 5, this is a sermon of Isaiah, one singular teaching of Isaiah, probably given all at one time, as he came to warn the people of the threat that was before them. First, he opens the sermon with what we talked about Sunday, that magnificent vision of the future kingdom. And it's a great way to begin because he lays out for Israel, this is the future. This is what you have coming. This is the promise. This is what there is to look forward to. This is the reason why living holy now is worth it. He talks about Messiah's reign. Remember from the mountain of the house of the Lord. Chapter 2, verses 1 through 5. And he even says there in verse 5, Come, house of Jacob, let us walk in the light of the Lord. But from there, he begins to implore. And he begins to warn. And he begins to plead with the people. He weaves an earnest message. A message of increasing sorrow. That gets heavier as we go. And I just want to give you a warning tonight. This is no lighthearted Christmas fable. The teaching tonight is heavy, serious teaching. This is warning. There are woes. He lands in chapter 5 in kind of the centerpiece of this message, of this sermon, what's been called the Song of the Vineyard, which sounds wonderful. The Song of the Vineyard. Oh, yes, the Song of the Vineyard, but it's more of an elegy, a lament, a song of sorrow. We'll get there. But understand that tonight's study is serious. Isaiah chapter 1, or chapter 3, verse 1. For behold, the Lord God of hosts is going to remove from Jerusalem and Judah both supply and support. 
the whole supply of bread and the whole supply of water. Right as we begin, Isaiah introduces a new name. It's used a couple other times in Scripture, but primarily, again, by Isaiah. And that is the Lord God of hosts, Adonai Yahweh Sabah. Adonai Yahweh Sabah. And Isaiah only uses this name. He'll do it 11 times in his prophecy, in this scroll, in this book. But he only uses it as a name for God when the Lord is on the seat of judgment. So whenever we see the Lord God of hosts, Adonai, Yahweh Sabah, it is when God has taken his place in the seat of judgment, he is raising the gavel, and he's about to smash down judgment on the people. And so he begins here with the Lord God of hosts. A couple of examples of this back in chapter 1, verse 24, when he says, Therefore the Lord God of hosts, Adonai, Yahweh, Sabah, the mighty one of Israel declares, Ah, I will be relieved of my adversaries and avenge myself on my foes. He sits in judgment there of the enemies of Israel. In chapter 10 of the book of Isaiah, verse 33, He says, the Lord, the God of hosts, will lop off the boughs with a terrible crash. Those also who are tall in stature will be cut down, and those who are lofty will be abased. Isaiah will, interesting, many times throughout his prophecy, will talk about abasing the proud. Bringing those who are prideful to a humble place. And what's interesting about that to me is by the time we land in Isaiah 53, we see why it's so important. Because in Isaiah 53, we see Messiah abased. We see the one who has every right to be glorified and to be lofty and to be prideful. He has the right. No one else does. But Jesus can take pride in himself. And yet he's the one that is brought low and cut off. So it makes sense that Isaiah would see this continuing theme that those who are prideful and lifted up will be cut down. And why shouldn't we be? When even our own Messiah was cut down. Chapter 19, verse 4, he says, Moreover, I will deliver the Egyptians into the hand of a cruel master, and a mighty king will rule over them, declares the Lord God of hosts. Again, God sitting in judgment, pronouncing judgment. As his gavel falls now on Israel, in these chapters and in this section, the rug of the false sense of security is yanked out from under them. And that's, I believe, Isaiah's intention. To stir them up, to shake them up, to show them that the false security that they felt like they had under King Uzziah ranged 52 years. Ah, oh, we're good. we got a long-term king. We've got long-term prosperity. Everything's fine in Jerusalem. Everything's okay. God's not going to let anything happen to us. And they got into this lull with Uzziah. And then Yotam, his, his son, comes along, not a very good king, not a horrible king, not great, you know, he's the one who stops going to temple because his dad contracted leprosy there, (laughs) and so Yatam comes along, and under these two guys, this false sense of security, it fails, Isaiah is going to tell us this message, everything you rely on, and this speaks to us today, everything you rely on aside from the Lord will fail, let's listen in. Verse 2, not only will he remove the whole supply of bread and the whole supply of water, verse 2, the mighty man and the warrior, note these individuals, the judge and the prophet, the diviner and the elder, the captain of 50, the honorable man, the counselor and the expert artisan or literally magician, and the skillful enchanter. He's going to remove all of these. And I will make mere lads their princes and capricious children will rule over them. Now, hang on a second. Look at all these people. What's he saying here? In the very beginning, as he starts to lay into this message, he says life support is going to be removed. Your whole supply of bread, your whole supply of water, the basics, the staple foods in Jerusalem, they're going to be gone. You're not even going to be able to get water. Things will be so bad. Life support. Levels of military strength will be weakened. And he goes from top to the bottom. He goes from the mighty commander to the captain of 50 to the single warrior. And every level of military might, you will be weak. Legitimate authority is about to be undermined. The judge, the prophet, the counselor, the honorable man, the elder, they're going to be of no help to you, Israel. 
But notice who else he mentions in the list. I find this fascinating. He says, by the way, the diviner, the expert artisan or magician, and the skillful enchanter. So illegitimate authority will be of no use to you as well. You can run out and try to go to these guys. You can get your palms red. It's not going to matter. You get your palm blue. It's not going to make any difference. And we have some parallels with Isaiah's day, don't we? I think about our life support. How many of us live on just the basic basics? I mean, really? How many of us just are barely getting by with a crust of bread, you know, and a bottled water? We have so much, so much more than that. I think about our levels of military strength, and I am so proud and and honored to have a church that is so close to the naval base. Right on. But if we're putting our hope and our trust and our faith in our military that is spread so thin across the earth, legitimate authority. There's some legitimate authority. There's some good people in government. I know they're hard to find, but they're there. (laughs) And our culture that is chasing after illegitimate authority right and left. We're going to see more parallels with our culture in our day and Israel's day with Isaiah as we go on tonight. But Isaiah is saying all of these things provide nothing more than a false sense of security. The problem is this. And I love our Constitution. And I love the Declaration of Independence. But understand this. The problem Israel had in these days and what Isaiah is prophesying against is that it's all of the people, by the people, and for the people rather than of the Lord, by the Lord, and for the Lord. Amen. Of the people, by the people, for the people. I understand where that's coming from. And I understand to govern in a way that honors all the people is, is a noble thought. But if it's about the people and not about the Lord, we are in for trouble. What made Israel great under David and Solomon was that it was about the Lord, especially under David. His heart was 100% to the Lord. He loved the Lord. And there was a trickle-down effect to all of the kingdom of Israel because it was about God. When our country was founded, for the most part, it was about the Lord. It was that we would be underneath, established under the authority of God. But when it becomes more about the people than about the Lord, when that is cast out, authority nationally, civically, or personally begins to fail. And life itself fails. And it is just my opinion, but the financial state of our union is directly tied, I believe, to the spiritual state of our union. And it's not great ideas that we need in the presidency or in the Congress It's a return to the Lord. Verse 4, he continues, he says, I will make mere lads their princes, and capricious children will rule over them. (laughs) And the people will be oppressed, each one by another, and each one by his neighbor. The youth will storm against the elder, and the inferior against the honorable. Uh, It's interesting what he's saying. Mere lads and capricious children. In the Hebrew, it's na'arim and ta'alulim. Mere lads, na'arim, literally youngsters. Youngsters are going to rule. I like ta'alulim even better. Pranksters. Youngsters and pranksters. Deceitful leaders. These now are going to be in charge. Youthfulness wins out over experience. Likeability trumps ability. God says this is the leadership that you have And it's going to get worse. This is what's coming. He says in verse 6, When a man lays hold of his brother in his father's house, saying, You have a cloak. You shall be our ruler. And these ruins will be under your charge. He will protest on that day, saying, I will not be your healer. For in my house there is neither bread nor cloak. You should not appoint me ruler of the people. What's this mean? It means the people need a leader. And in these days, people are desperate for one, but as the gavel of judgment falls, they start looking for anyone to lead. I don't have a jacket, but you do. So you're the boss. You lead us. You take care of these ruins, this destruction. 
But as he shows us in verse 7, no one will be willing to step up. No one will be willing to to lead out in a godly way. Verse 8, for Jerusalem has stumbled and Judah has fallen because, note this, their speech and their actions are against the Lord to rebel against his glorious presence. Wow, this set me back. We embrace free speech in our country. We love free speech. But when the truth is maligned and when the provocative and the offensive are protected, something's wrong. When our speech and our right to say and do anything becomes more important, even offensive things, than being able to speak truth. Something's wrong. Did you hear about it? Loudoun County in Leesburg, Virginia, at the county courthouse. There were nine approved holiday displays. People went in and they, you know, put in their application, hey, I'd like to put this display up. And one that was approved that caused quite a stir. It was a Santa Claus skeleton nailed to a cross. Yeah. And the people of Leesburg were so upset. In fact, someone went and and vandalized it, tore it down, and it was smashed up. It was put up by an atheist mother and her son. And it was approved. The county courthouse said, well, free speech. Well, I'm sorry, but to me, that's absolutely offensive. And you're telling us no manger scenes? But we can put a skeleton Santa on a cross. It, unbelievable. What he's saying here is it's not just our actions. Their speech and their actions are against the Lord to rebel against his glorious presence. And gang, the truth is our speech reveals either our faith or our rebellion. Jesus made it very clear, Matthew 15, 11, it's not what enters the mouth that defiles the man, but what proceeds out of the mouth, this defiles the man. He said in verse 18 of Matthew 15, the things that proceed out of the mouth come from the heart, and those defile the man. Verse 9. Now this is all going on in Israel. I'm not talking about America. It's Israel. Verse 9. The expression of their faces bears witness against them. (laughs) If I had a nickel for every time one of my kids had an expression on their face that bore witness to what they were really thinking. I need you to go take out the trash. (laughs) I won't go any further than that, but you know what I'm saying. You parents, you get it. (laughs) They do not even conceal it. And he says, woe to them. By the way, Isaiah will use the phrase woe more than any of the prophets. He uses it quite extensively. Woe to them, for they have brought evil on themselves. Say to the righteous that it will go well with them, for they will eat the fruit of their actions. Woe to the wicked. It will go badly with him, for what he deserves will be done to him. And this is not a new doctrine. This is not something, whoa, this guy's saying something we've never heard before. Moses said it. Numbers 32, 23, be sure your sin will find you out. Mm-hmm. And, and the whole theology here, and understand this, we're not even to the point where God is pouring out wrath, where God is saying, I'm going to hammer the people. The gavel of judgment is saying, your own sin is messing you up. Your own choices are bringing about consequence that now you have to deal with the pain. And anyone who's lived any amount of life, you know, Sometimes sin that we committed years ago, we still feel the sting. It's not because God's sitting there going, I want to remind you, I'm going to... It's actually Satan is trying to remind us of our past. But it's the sin that causes the hurt, which is why God hates it so much. That's why Paul said in Galatians 6, 7, Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. Whatever a man sows, this he will also reap. You sow to the flesh, you're going to reap the flesh. You sow to the Spirit, you're going to reap spiritual things. Verse 12, he says, Oh, my people, their oppressors are children, and women rule over them. Woo-hoo. Yeah. I'll explain that in a bit. Oh, my people, those who guide you, lead you astray, and confuse the direction of your paths. Everything is upside down in Israel. Now, ladies, you just got to bear with me and be patient here for a second. But it's upside down. Inexperience is over experience. Immaturity over maturity. 
Even women walking all over men. Mm. Well, it could be a little offensive, especially if you happen to be a woman. Mm. It's not talking about inherent worth or value or who is better, a man or a woman. What's being talked about here, and you're going to see this, is divinely established roles functioning in an unhealthy way. God establishes roles, and when we step out of those, okay, it's not, ladies, it's not a, 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 it's not a chain to be in the position of a wife or a mother. It's a blessing. It's a gift. It's something you were created for to be in the role of a woman. There are things women can do, men cannot do. There are ways women think and feel, and their spiritual sensitivity that is very different than that of a man. And there are reasons why God says, I want this for women, I want this for men. And it's only our sin-sick world that says, no, 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 we're going to do it our way. Yep. And Isaiah says part of the problem here now is that things are flipped and women are ruling over men. And he's talking about a usurping of authority and a usurping of power and women taking control of things in a way that they shouldn't be doing. He's talking about wickedness. He's not talking about good women serving the Lord. Okay? What he means here is the influence of the daughters of Zion, because on their men it's apparently far from godly, and Isaiah is going to come back and address that in just a moment. Verse 13, the Lord arises to contend and stands to judge the people. The Lord enters into judgment with the elders and princes of his people. It is you who have devoured the vineyard. The plunder of the poor is in your houses. What do you mean by crushing my people and grinding the face of the poor, declares, here it is again, the Lord God of hosts. What are you doing? Now, we might not catch this, but he's using a word picture here that is brilliant and it makes sense for Israel. He's comparing Judah to a brutal bakery. What do you mean? If you look at verse 15... What do you mean by crushing my people and grinding the face of the poor? The Israelite in the day would understand that millstones crush the grain. And once the millstone crushes the grain, it's ground into flour, and then they bake that into bread for their own mouths. And that's the picture he's giving here, is taking the poor and crushing them and grinding them to make bread for the rich. And in this word picture, Adonai Yahweh Sabah says... That's what you're doing to my people. Those who are in power are making bread out of those who are poor. You know, the Lord has quite a bit to say about the poor and our responsibility. Isaiah 58, verse 6, he says, Is this not the fast which I choose? To loosen the bonds of wickedness, to undo the bands of the yoke, to let the oppressed go free and break every yoke. Is it not to divide your bread with the hungry and bring the homeless poor into the house when you see the naked to cover him and not to hide yourself from your own flesh? It is our responsibility to care for the poor. It is our responsibility to care for brothers and sisters. It is our responsibility to look out for those who don't have as much as we have. I'm not talking about higher taxation for the rich. I'm talking about the responsibility of every believer in Jesus Christ to look at the world around us and say, where is their hurting? Where is their anguish? Where is their poverty? How can I help? What can I do? So the Lord God of hosts pronounces judgment on the leaders, but God believes in equal rights for men and women because He knows all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And so now he judges the daughters of Zion, the women. Listen up. Verse 16. Moreover, the Lord said, because the daughters of Zion are proud and walk with heads held high and seductive eyes and go along with mincing or literally dainty steps and tinkle the bangles on their feet. Therefore, the Lord will afflict the scalp of the daughters of Zion with scabs, and the Lord will make their foreheads bare. <laughs> wow. That's kind of brutal. You just come out of the hairdresser, it's all fine, it's looking good, and all of a sudden, <laughs> it's Pastor Rick! You know? Pastor, the bald. What he's talking about here is drawing back the hair, which is a glory to a woman, Paul says. 
drawing back so that we can see what's really going on inside the head. He says more about this. He doesn't buy the dumb blonde theory. See, God knows these daughters of Zion know what they're doing. And they're dancing and they're parading around in their adornment. He knows they know. Verse 18, he says, In that day the Lord will take away the beauty of their anklets, headbands, headbands, crescent ornaments, dangling earrings, bracelets, veils, headdresses, ankle chains, sashes, perfume boxes, amulets, finger rings, nose rings, festal robes, outer tunics, cloaks, money purses. Are we in Nordstrom? What is this? Hand mirrors, undergarments, turbans, and veils. All of these things. He says it will come about that instead of sweet perfume, there will be putrefaction. Great word. I'm going to use that more. In fact, this week, let's make that the word of the week. Putrefaction. Okay. Instead of a belt, a rope. Instead of a well-set hair, a plucked out scalp. Instead of fine clothes, a donning of sackcloth and branding instead of beauty. What's that talking about? Slavery. Your men will fall by the sword and your mighty ones in battle, and her gates will lament and mourn, and deserted she will sit on the ground. For seven women will take hold of one man in that day, saying, We will eat our own bread and wear our own clothes, only let us be called by your name. Take away our reproach. In other words, the warriors are going to be slain. The men are going to be wiped out. And there's going to be at least a seven to one ratio in Jerusalem. And now seven women saying, well, let's band together and take one husband for the seven of us because we, we have to at least have a husband. We, we need children. We need to be able to continue. And they're not going to be able to find it. They'll be husbandless. They'll be childless. They will be alone. And they will be in mourning. This prophecy, gang, would be realized in the fall of Jerusalem, 586 B.C. It would be realized again when Jerusalem fell in A.D. 70. And in fact, throughout the history of Israel, this has been realized again and again and again, all the way up to the Holocaust. We have seen this happen. The branding instead of beauty. You know, when when, uh, Titus leveled Jerusalem in A.D. 70, something that was discovered was he had a commemorative gold coin made. And on this gold coin, it showed a Jewish woman sitting on the ground under a palm tree in mourning with the caption on it, Judea Capta, Captive Judah. And some wonder, perhaps, if Titus, that Roman commander, read Isaiah's words and thought he'd put it on a coin. She will sit in mourning on the ground. Now, you read through that, and ladies, if I was a woman, I'm so thankful I'm not, I might ask the question, should a woman never wear earrings? I mean, or bracelets? Or anklets? Or shop at Nordstrom? I mean, should a woman just avoid all this stuff and go, you know, no makeup, and and no adornment whatsoever, and... Should sackcloth be the fashion statement of women at the bridge? (laughs) Gang, listen. Ladies, you should never wear earrings, bracelets, anklets, or any of these fineries ever if it's a cover for sin. If it's a cover for bad influence or wrong motives or self-elevation at the expense of those who have less. Ladies, the Bible is clear on this. If you want to have a good, godly, powerful influence for the kingdom and in this world, wives, be submissive to your husbands. I didn't write that, by the way. So, ladies, have a conversation with Peter. He said in 1 Peter 3, verse 1, Wives, be submissive to your husbands so that if any of them are disobedient to the word... They may be won without a word by the behavior of their wives. As they observe your chaste and respectful behavior, your adornment must not be merely external, braiding the hair, wearing gold jewelry, or putting on dresses, but the hidden person of the heart, with the imperishable quality of a gentle and quiet spirit, which is precious in the sight of Peter. 
Oh no, it doesn't say that. Which is precious in the sight of Pastor Rick. No, it doesn't say that. This is precious in the sight of God. It's what God is looking for. It's not Peter's standard of influence. It's no man's standard of influence for a woman. Ladies, this is God's standard of influence. You want to be most influential, that's how you do it. But I was going to run for office. That's cool. But do so respecting and loving and in submission to your husband. I think Michelle Bachman, by the way, does that. I've been very impressed with her. I'm not saying vote for her. We don't even know if she's going to be on the ticket. But I am telling you that there's an example of someone who has, at least from my perspective so far, walked it out like that. Dressing from the rag bag this holiday season is not the answer here. Daughters of Jesus, the answer is the inner woman where the Spirit of Christ resides. That's where the power is. That's where the influence is. And by the way, guys, we can learn something from that. Our power, our influence in this world is not in what we do. It's in who we are in Christ Jesus. It's the hidden person of the heart that Jesus has taken authority over. That's our greatest influence. Well, the Lord God of hosts, in this scathing rebuke, through Isaiah, he's just taken apart the upper crust here, the ruling class. And it's not unlike Jesus' words to the Pharisees when he begins to pronounce woes. Interesting because chapter 5 will end with a series of woes, but we're not there yet. Understand, this is not judgment for judgment's sake. And I love this about Isaiah because as much as he brings the heavy-handed judgment, he also brings great promise. And he keeps saying, look, here's the judgment, but here's the promise. He's about to do that right now. Verse 2 of chapter 4. In fact, verses 2 through 6 are what we could call the prophecy of the branch. And this is awesome. Verse 2. In that day, the branch of the Lord will be beautiful and glorious. And the fruit of the earth will be the pride and the adornment of the survivors of Israel. Listen, go back to verse 1. Seven women will take hold of one man in that day, saying, We will eat our own bread, wear our own clothes, only let us be called by your own name. Take away our reproach. What day is this? This is the tribulation. This is at the end of the tribulation. This is not the conquering of Jerusalem by Babylon in 586 or by Rome in 70. This is the destruction of Israel and Jerusalem by Antichrist and the world powers and the forces. When Jesus comes back, and right before Jesus comes back, chapter 3 happens. Everything we just read will happen, will be taking place. And in that day, verse 2, the branch of the Lord will be beautiful and glorious. Why? Because when Israel sees him in that day and recognizes their salvation has finally come, oh, praise God, Mashiach is here. I love this. The branch of the Lord. It will come about that he who is left in Zion and remains in Jerusalem will be called holy. Everyone who is recorded for life in Jerusalem. Listen, Isaiah again vaults ahead to the final fulfillment of God's messianic promise to Israel. The prophecy of the branch. The word here, the Hebrew word for branch, is samach. Samach. If you're jotting it down, you can kind of alliterate that as T-S-E-M-A-C-H or M-A-H. Samach. And it literally means bud, sprout, or growth, as in vegetation. They would use this word to describe the growth of some vegetation. The branch that, that grows up, Samach. And this is the first mention of the prophecy of the branch in Scripture, which is significant. Back in, Jerusalem, in, in Genesis, we had a lot of first mentions, it being the first book. And they've kind of thinned out as we've gone through Scripture and studied through the Bible. Now here we are in Isaiah, and we have a new first mention, the branch. The branch. We need to pause and think about this just for a moment. Whenever Samach is used, branch, whenever it's used in conjunction with Yahweh or David, David, it's always messianic. So if, if you see Samach Yahweh, branch of God, or Samach David, the branch of David, it's talking about Messiah. It's a messianic statement. And you might want to know these five passages. Keeping your finger there, go to Isaiah chapter 11. Isaiah 11, which we'll come back and we're going to look at real specifically after Christmas, Lord willing. Isaiah 11, verse 1, where he says, Then a shoot 
will spring from the stem of Jesse and a branch from his roots will bear fruit. The spirit of the Lord will rest on him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and strength, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. And he will delight in the fear of the Lord. And he will not judge by what his eyes see, nor make a decision by what his ears hear. But with righteousness, he will judge the poor and decide with fairness for the afflicted of the earth. And he will strike the earth with the rod of his mouth, with the breath of his lips, he will slay the wicked. Also, righteousness will be the belt about his loins and faithfulness the belt about his waist. The wolf will dwell with the lamb. The leopard will lie down with the young goat and the calf and the young lion and the fatling together. And a little boy will lead them. We'll stop there. But the prophecy of the branch, the branch, this is clearly a statement, a teaching about Messiah. Back again in chapter 11, verse 1, where it says, a branch from his roots will bear fruit. Hebrews chapter 7 Verse 14 tells us the Lord was descended from Judah. I wish they would translate more specifically because the Greek word for descended is anatello and it means sprang forth. So the Hebrew writer is is referencing the prophecy of the branch. When he says, our Lord was descended, our Lord sprang forth from Judah, branched out from Judah, was born of the line of the tribe of Judah. But note this. In verse 1 of Isaiah 11, the word for branch is not samach. Normally, samach is the word. But here, the word is, some of you Bible students know, netzar. Netzer. It's a different word. Why does Isaiah suddenly use, in one place, and this is the only place he does this, everywhere else he talks about the branch, in fact, every other prophecy of the branch, is samach. Only here it's netzer. Why? Why? It's to tie it directly to Jesus. Okay? Because Netzer, Bible students, what word do we... Nazarene. Nazarene. Netzer is the root word of Nazareth. And so here Isaiah says, Netzer, a Netzer will, from his roots, will bear fruit. Jesus the Nazarene. And I believe Isaiah is making a specific connection to Jesus. Why? Because Matthew 2.21 says, Joseph got up and took the child and his mother and came into the land of Israel. But when he heard that Archelaus was reigning over Judea in the place of his father Herod, he was afraid to go there. Then after being warned by God in a dream, he left for the regions of the Galilee. And he came and he lived in a city called Nazareth to fulfill what was spoken through the prophets, he shall be called a Nazarene. You can't find that in the Hebrew prophets. Most places where Hebrew prophecy is quoted in the New Testament, you can go back and go, oh yeah, it's Isaiah 53, or oh yeah, we see that in Zechariah 12. We understand. Here, he shall be called a Nazarene. It's nowhere in the Hebrew prophets unless you read it in Hebrew. And we see it right here in Isaiah chapter 11, verse 1. The Netzer, he shall be called a Nazarene. He shall be called a branch. Interesting. Go from there. Keeping your finger still in Isaiah, go over to Jeremiah chapter 23. Five major passages here. Beginning in Isaiah 4 and jumping to Isaiah 11 and now Jeremiah 23. Verse... Five. Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will raise up for David a righteous branch. And he will reign as king and act wisely and do justice and righteousness in the land. In his days, Judah will be saved. And Israel will dwell securely. And this is his name by which he will be called the Lord our righteousness or Yahweh Sidkenu. Another prophecy of the branch. Go over to uh, Jeremiah 33. Jeremiah 33. Now I want to take you to each of these places. You just want to jot these down. Be aware of them. Maybe make a note in the margin of your Bible. Prophecy of the branch. Okay. Jeremiah 33, verse 15. Look at verse 14. Behold, days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will fulfill the good word which I have spoken concerning the house of Israel and the house of Judah. In those days and at that time, I will cause a righteous branch of David, Samach David, to spring forth. 
And he shall execute justice and righteousness on the earth. In those days Judah, Judah will be saved and Jerusalem will dwell in safety. And this is the name by which you will be called. The Lord is our righteousness. So, so the branch's name is Yahweh Sidkenu, the Lord our righteousness. And Jerusalem will be called Yahweh Sidkenu, the Lord our righteousness. His city will be called by his name. Zechariah. Go over to the book of Zechariah. Second to last one in the Hebrew Scripture, Zechariah chapter 3. Verse 8. Now listen, Joshua the high priest, you and your friends who are sitting in front of you. Indeed, they are men who are assembled. For behold, I am going to bring my servant the branch. Again, Samach, my servant in the branch. Go over to Zechariah chapter 6, verse 12. And we've seen this one before. In fact, I think we quoted this on Sunday. Then say to him, Thus says the Lord of hosts, Behold, a man whose name is Branch, for he will branch out from where he is, and he will build the temple of the Lord. Yes, it is he who will build the temple of the Lord, and he will sit, he, and he will... Uh, he who will bear the honor and sit and rule on his throne, thus he will be a priest on his throne, and the council of peace will be between the two offices. So all five of those, you can go back to Isaiah, are the prophecy of the branch, the Samach. And because of this, from the earliest times, Jewish rabbis and scholars always interpreted the term branch as a reference to Messiah. In fact, they used it as a nickname. Early Jewish scholars will re- refer to Samach. And whenever they refer to Samach, they're talking about Mashiach, Messiah, who is the branch. But I want you to see something about this branch. Back in chapter 4, verse 2, the book of Isaiah. It tells us, in that day, the branch of the Lord will be beautiful and glorious. Note, first off, that he is the branch of the Lord. The branch of the Lord. He is of the Lord. He is the Lord. He is God. The branch of the Lord is telling us right there that He is God. Now, I want to address something because people have misunderstood the concept of the Son of God. We talked about this the other day, right, Debbie? The concept of the Son of God, which Debbie understands, but, but we're having a conversation with another person trying to, trying to get this out. People will look at Jesus and say, He's the Son of God. He's not God. He's just a son. In the same way that Hayden is not Rick... You know, he's, just, he's Rick's son, but he's not Rick. We're missing something when we try to interpret it that way. My sons, true, they branch out from me and from my wife, and so they are human. Jesus branches out from God, and so he is God. You understand that? He is God. In the same way that my son is human. I'm human. Son of human is, is human. Son of God is God. But it's more profound than that. More profound even than the way my biological children are human. All of my children are human. They don't always act human, but they are. But Hebrews chapter 1 verse 3 tells us, He is the radiance of His glory and the exact representation of His nature and upholds all things by the, things by the word of His power. Now, some will say, well, see, it says he's the exact representation, so he's not really God. Listen, the Greek word for representation is character. And that's the Greek word, character. Character. Our word, character. Character meaning the very nature. He is the exact nature of his nature. Well, the word nature is hoatos, which means of him. So understanding in the Greek, he's the radiance of his glory. He is the exact nature of him. Jesus is the nature of God. Jesus is God in the flesh. So understanding that this branch of the Lord is the Son of God, He is God among us. Now I know a lot of you just understand that. You don't have a problem with that. I just need it to be clear. In fact, even Jesus' enemies understood that. It made perfect sense to them. John 5.18 says, For this reason, the Jews were seeking all the more to kill Him. Because he was not only breaking the Sabbath, but he was calling God his own Father, making himself equal with God. They were right. They were wrong in their behavior and in their attitude toward him, but they were right. He was making himself equal with God because Jesus 
was God in the flesh. Is God, Emmanuel, God among us? But here's the miracle and the wonder of all this. Jesus, who is God, comes to earth and he is also human. And we see this even in the prophecy of the branch. In that day, the branch of the Lord will be beautiful and glorious. And the fruit of the earth will be the pride and the adornment of the survivors of Israel. He is also called the fruit of the earth. He's the branch of the Lord, and he is the fruit of the earth. The branch, he is God. Fruit of the earth, he is man. He puts on earthly flesh, an earth suit, if you will. And he is, as we are going to talk about on Sunday, Emmanuel, God with us. Verse 3 says it will come about that he who is left in Zion and remains in Jerusalem will be called holy. Everyone who is recorded for life in Jerusalem, and that is indicating, gang, eternal life. And this is the remnant of Israel. Verse 3, all of those who are left and remains, the remainment, the remnant, those who are there, who are at the end of that tribulation when Jesus comes back, and they're recorded for life. And verse 4 says, when the Lord has washed away the filth of the daughters of Zion and purged the bloodshed of Jerusalem from her midst by the spirit of judgment and the spirit of burning. Then the Lord will create over the whole area of Mount Zion and over her assemblies a cloud by day, even smoke, and the brightness of a flaming fire by night over all The glory will be a canopy. There will be a shelter to give shade from the heat of day and refuge and protection from the storm and from the rain. I believe this is a literal promise that over Jerusalem in the millennial kingdom, there will be a supernatural canopy that will bring a gracious covering to that great city. Over the inhabitants of Jerusalem there in the kingdom age. But note this, it comes about after the purging by the spirit of judgment and fire. What is that? It's the time of Jacob's trouble. Jacob's distress, the tribulation, but a remnant remains. The purging of judgment, spirit of judgment, spirit of fire. God says in Zechariah 13, 8, it will come about in all the land that two parts in it will be cut off and perish and the third will be left in it. And I will bring the third part through the fire, refine them as silver is refined, test them as gold is tested. They will call on my name, and I will answer them, and I will say, they are my people, and they will say, the Lord is my God. One third of Israel will be brought through the tribulation and survive. Two thirds of the Jewish people will perish. As all Jewish people living, two thirds will not make it through the tribulation. I need you to understand, and we need to be sensitive and compassionate when we remind each other, speak this verse. This is not our desire for Israel. That's not what we want to see happen. Nor is it God's desire that two-thirds of all Israel is going to perish. This is what will happen. God speaks these words as warning of what is to come. It's not his desire to destroy and crush Israel. It is his determination to save his people for their posterity, for their inheritance, for the kingdom he has promised them. But it's going to get to the point where the only way to do that is to bring them through tribulation. Because, you know, sometimes the only way is the hard way. And we, I think, have experienced that, many of us in our own lives. Sometimes the only way is the hard way. God, why is his life so much more difficult than her life? Why is my life in this season so hard and his is not? Not that comparison is ever a good idea. It's not. But do you ever wonder why sometimes the fire seems hotter for some people than for others? Take two brothers in Christ, both who love the Lord, both who serve the Lord, both who are doing his work, and one seems to be going through fire, and the other one seems to be fine. And and you wonder, what's going on here, Lord? God's not playing favorites. You know, He's not chosen one above the other to have an easy life and one to have the hard life. It is God doing, listen, it's God doing everything that He needs to do to save. And it might not even be you that He's taking you through the fire to save. He may be taking you through the fire to save somebody else who will watch you going through the fire with the grace of Jesus. 
And he knows that on the other side of the fire, you will come through more purified. That person will be saved. And on the other side of heaven, we will all praise God for it. We're going to praise him for our pain. Do you realize that? For our anguish, our hardship, our persecution. The stuff of life that was so difficult. We're going to look back and go, wow, thank you so much. Thank you for that season. Thank you, Lord.